section two of horror stories by ada buisson this librivox recording is in the public domain a story told in a church part b ah heaven how well i remember that christmas eve how joyously it began how gay we were i know i can say for myself that never since have i laughed with such free-hearted joy as i did that night there was little ceremony no elaborate toilettes we all knew each other and the female element considerably preponderated but the dancing was no less delightful the smiles no less radiant the enjoyment no less intense in the early part of the evening perhaps there might have been a little jealousy regarding the attentions of arthur power but he soon showed such evident preference for irena dupont that the rest retired from the contest and who could wonder that she should be preferred simply dressed in white muslin with a sash of scarlet silk round her waist irena seemed to float amongst us like some goddess amongst her attendant nymphs she never seemed to try to be dignified and yet she always walked like a young queen always stood amongst us with her tall graceful form as superior to the rest of us as diana amongst her nymphs it was no use millicent power looking cold and haughty arthur cared not he saw only those sweet dark eyes of her french cousin heard only that rich merry laugh cared only to wind his arm round that pliant waist even in the games which relieved the dance arthur contrived always to be near Irena and though now and then he paid attention to his cousin milly even she saw that it was because he felt it a duty rather than because he wished to do so i thought i knew millicent power well i thought i understood her reserved character but that night she puzzled me she was too ladylike to show temper or even jealousy at arthur's sudden desertion but now and then she glanced at that part of the room where he was with such wild pained eyes now passionately angry now sorrowful that even i wondered she could so betray herself to him still she did not keep herself away from the rest she joined in all the dances and games and talked and laughed as excitedly as any of us more so almost and i recollect that it was millicent's voice which was the first to accept the challenge that led to so much sorrow our party was too large to be accommodated even at the large school table all at the same time so we younger ones had taken our supper first and then returned to the dancing-room leaving mrs morris to entertain the elders and it so happened that we had no wise friend near to prevent the commencement of as foolish a freak as ever young wild creatures planned how it was that the subject of ghosts was started i know not but i remember that instead of returning to our games we stood grouped together listening to a wild story arthur power was telling and though all laughed and declared their disbelief in it there were few voices that responded to his challenge at the conclusion i would wager this and he held up a small gold locket that not one person here would venture now to cross the churchyard alone enter the church and pass through and bring me a piece of the cypress waving over the broken tomb on the other side what make the tour of the churchyard in this cold no thank you said one sensibly oh you may put on galoshes and a warm cloak besides it's a splendid night the snow is hard as iron ha ha i see ladies and gentlemen it is the white feather not the cold i should not be afraid exclaimed millicent as you say it is a splendid night i will go and so will i i exclaimed and so will i exclaimed irena no sooner said than done upstairs we three adventurous ones crept to don warm cloaks and then cautiously opening the front door 
for we knew if mrs morris heard aught of such a proceeding she would quickly stop it not five minutes later i with the key of the church in my hand started at a quick pace over the hard snowy walk it was agreed that ten minutes after i had started millicent should follow and at an equal period after irena was to come for argued arthur the elders would probably have finished supper soon and it would not be safe to wait for the return of each before the other started ah how well i remember that mad midnight walk it was a brilliant night but the cold was so intense that i had not reached the gate of the churchyard close as it was before i repented of my folly however i went in i was not of a timid nature and that walk across the snowy churchyard was not in the least fearful to me the silence of the decorated ancient church about which i had heard legends enough to terrify any one affected me more and i confess as the door grated slowly on its hinges i felt sorely tempted to turn and flee i did walk very quickly along the stone aisle and it was with a gasp of intense relief that i stepped out into the snow and moonlight again through the little chancel door close to which stood the broken tomb and its dark cypress my hand trembled so that i could scarcely pluck the bough and then i fairly ran along the side path which led to the other gate opening into the back garden of mount silver by st george you have only been a quarter of an hour exclaimed arthur power i wonder how fast milly will run you look rather white though miss montem the cold is intense i answered rather crossly and it was a foolish thing to do did you meet the ghost of the monk never mind whom i met there is the cypress bough arthur shrugged his shoulders and turned away still watch in hand twenty minutes no twenty-five minutes milly must be having quite a gossip with the monk he said presently not quite so pleasantly though twenty-seven ah there she is yes there was milly ghostly white and shivering arthur approached her almost anxiously and though he made some joking remark about her having met a legion of ghosts i observed that he took her hand and began rubbing it and then muttered something in a low tone which however only turned milly's shivering into a convulsive shudder give her something hot to drink i exclaimed from my corner where i was also still shivering the cold no one knows what the cold of that church is and then milly lifted up her eyes with a look heaven how that look haunted me afterwards and she managed to mutter with her sweet lips yes the awful cold i wish to goodness irena would come now before mrs morris returns said some one she will be so angry about this and then arthur power looked at his watch again but this time said nothing a silence fell upon us all not a word was spoken no one moved even every one listened listened for that light step which should announce the approach for which somehow we all so longed the clock struck one and again arthur looked at his watch and then again that silence continued unbroken and there motionless we all remained waiting for her for her who was never to come to us no use our listening no use watching those slow-moving hands of the great clock never never more were we to hear the fall of those quick light feet time might come and time might go but irena dupont would not return with it oh that miserable night how the memory of it has haunted me those sad horror-stricken faces which not two hours ago had been so happy the frightened whispering the coming to and fro of anxious searchers waving their lurid torchlight over the snow the sobs the tears 
the wild hopes and at length the blank despair how i remember it all as some dreadful confusion which strive as i would i could not comprehend a mystery indeed had fallen upon us that christmas night a mystery which none could solve all we knew was that irena dupont had gone out fresh and living into the snow and darkness and that she never came back the path from the house to the church was direct enough it was perfectly safe there were no bad characters about so far as our human ken could reach it all of us could declare to its perfect safety and evidence of any struggle or accident there was none search was not spared and for weeks every means of discovering what had become of the lost girl was freely tried but that solemn christmas night refused to give up its secret and the mystery of the beautiful french girl's fate remained still darkly hidden but in spite of those great sorrows which come to disturb the current of life commonplace daily realities must be thought of and faced i had learnt that lesson in the year of hard struggling i went through on quitting mrs morris's pleasant roof to take the place of junior teacher in a german school and yet i confess i felt almost horrified at the contents of a letter i received one june morning from my old friend millicent power she was going to be married to arthur she wrote and she hoped i would come and act as bridesmaid what had she forgotten so soon that horrible christmas story i thought with her usual forethought she had enclosed a banknote for my travelling expenses and she made her request in terms which a lonely orphan like myself was not likely to resist lady jane was dead leaving millicent sole heiress to her property but milly told me she could not endure the solitude of power place and still lived with mrs morris from whose house she was to be married i was to go to her there and i should find more than one familiar face to welcome me it is only those who are homeless who can sympathize with me in the intense affection i bore to that dear old house and all its occupants and the eagerness with which in spite of my weariness i leaned forward in the coach to catch the first glimpse of the tall ivy-covered chimneys i knew the horn announcing the entrance of the coach into the village would be heard at mount silver and i quite expected to see milly's fair face at the garden gate waiting for me there was one figure standing there between the rose bushes but it was mrs morris's not millicent's no my dear i would not allow milly out so late though the evening is mild she answered after the first embraces were over her health is very delicate and i sent her to bed although mrs morris spoke dryly and almost indifferently i could detect anxiety in her eyes and i knew that before long i should hear something of the reason for i was a favourite of hers and she had always treated me as a friend rather than a pupil i found that i was to sup in private with my former instructress and i was scarcely surprised when as soon as the first hospitable cares were over she began abruptly do you know dora i am very uneasy about milly i am not at all sure that this marriage ought to take place i started i mean of course on account of her health ever since that night when when you remember milly has been altering in a manner that perhaps others may not observe but which i have there is a family malady hereditary to the powers you probably know consumption ah i have heard that i wish it were only that sternly replied mrs morris as if forcing herself to utter the words it is something more awful insanity milly's nerves never seemed to have recovered the shock of that dreadful night 
i was literally too horrified to say a word and i knew scarcely whether to be glad or not when mrs morris suddenly rose and proposed going to millicent i was accustomed to her abrupt ways still when she paused at milly's door and said in a sharp whisper there is a week still to the wedding we must both watch and do our duty dora i shrank back in alarm and though that first interview relieved my mind i had not been twenty-four hours constantly in milly's company before i saw that mrs morris's observations were correct milly was altered she would suddenly break off in the middle of a sentence even about arthur and fall into a stony kind of quietude which was too strange to be the result of mere weakness sometimes too she was restless and the anxiety for her wedding-day to arrive was incomprehensible and almost painful she could not endure solitude either and if by any chance she awoke from one of her frequent dozings and found herself alone she would ring her bell with a fury which more than once broke the wire still she never permitted any one to sleep in her room at night and i was quite surprised when the day before the wedding she asked me if i would mind sleeping on the sofa at the foot of her bed ah oh, that sunday night was to be another of those which terror scorched into my memory it was an exceedingly hot night the room was a large one on the ground floor and the open window looked into the garden i could not sleep milly too tossed restlessly from side to side and though she slept moaned piteously time seemed as if it would never move on and hours seemed to elapse between the striking of each quarter i suppose however i must have dozed for suddenly i started up with the impression that some one had passed by me and hastily looking towards millicent's bed i saw that it was empty why instead of rushing to the door i flung on a cloak and barefooted as i was darted through the french window into the garden i know not it must have been some fate that guided me for there dimly visible passing through the little gate into the churchyard was a white figure i flew along but millicent went faster than i and with a strength and steadiness she never displayed in the day on she went up the little side paths never pausing but going on swiftly steadily towards the chancel door surely now she must pause unless by some chance the preparations for the marriage had caused the door to be left unlocked she passed in ah how i flew then though why except fearing some horrible catastrophe i know not and at length a second time i stood within that ancient church in the dead of night even as i entered a low piteous moan directed me to where i should follow my unfortunate friend and there in one of the grim side aisles where the stone pavement still bore latin inscriptions to departed monks i saw that white figure kneeling and moaning and bruising her soft fingers against the hard stone there i know it is there she muttered i lifted it then so easily it must come up again don't shriek so irena oh oh don't shriek so and then lifting up her white agonized face she desisted from her awful scratching at the stone and put her hands to her ears as if to shut out some dismal sounds i stood transfixed with horror not daring to approach for i saw that though she had her eyes open she was asleep but at that moment the chancel door slammed with an awful cry the sleeper started up gazed wildly round and then i saw her fall prone on the stone floor the life-blood flowing from her lips there was no wedding the next day in that ancient church 
millicent power lay gasping away her life and murmuring only two words god forgive god forgive but there was a horrified group standing round that stone and watching for the return of the explorer of the unknown ancient vault which was found under that cracked pavement there was no need to make much inquiry as to whose remains those were which then were brought to the light of day the long dark hair a small ring told all that was necessary to be told irena dupont was found again but beyond those words which in her miserable sleep millicent power uttered no light was shed on the mystery which enveloped her fate i who knew all that had passed and had seen the wild agony of her face as she knelt and tore at the stones felt that unless insanity could be alleged in her excuse millicent power's soul was loaded with an awful crime and as i remembered how she had been walking in that aisle when she left me and returned uttering that exclamation which was never finished i joined fervently in that dying prayer of hers god forgive that stone was broken in such a way that a chance glance would more likely have noticed that it could be raised easily than one accustomed to pass it day by day probably she had raised it and discovered the vault and leaving it open had forgotten it until that mad midnight visit i had passed through the centre aisle but irena might easily have taken the side one and but enough of this it is too dreadful and god forgive us all we were all huddled together as miss montem's voice dropped and if there was a word murmured before we were silenced by the sound of steps without it was only an echo of the prayer with which dora montem closed her story End of section two.